Welcome back. This is Pop Culture Network Radio. It is October 26, 2013. I am a day late. I, I apologize. I should have done this yesterday. I had a lot of stuff going on yesterday. Halloween party yesterday that uh, took up most of my evening. And uh, preparations for it took up most of my afternoon. But... I will have you know that it does tie into this show in the sense, last week we talked about cosplay, and people asked, if I ever do cosplay, and do I dress up as anything, and what would I do for Halloween, would I dress up, and I really had no ideas, and I really, uh, I just said I wasn't going to get into it, and whatever, and yesterday, I dressed up, I put on a costume, kind of, uh, for those of you that follow me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, any of those places, you saw the photo. Yesterday, I did, in fact, put on a costume of Willie Robertson from Duck Dynasty. That's right. I dressed up as one of the good fellas from Duck Dynasty. I actually got one of those fake long beards with the Duck Dynasty bandana. I got a t-shirt that says, Camo is my favorite color. I got a pair of green khakis and put on my hiking boots and uh, put on one of my uh, plaid shirts on top of it. And there you go. I was Willie Robertson from Duck Dynasty. So I dressed up. I dressed up in a costume. There you go. Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. I did it. And so uh, all of the uh, people that said uh, I, I, I would never do it or I thought I was too good for it or... Uh, you know, whatever snide comments you were making, you can go. Uh, you can go eat it now. I am drinking a Red Bull. It is early in the morning. I'm here at Killin Enterprises, the official store of the Pop Culture Network. Today is Halloween Comic Fest, and uh, we're getting the store ready for that. But since I never got around to recording a show last night, uh, I have to do it this morning. Um, the the store is pretty much prepped and ready. And so now I am recording. If you're unfamiliar with Halloween Comic Fest, it's basically like Free Comic Book Day. Uh, that happens at the beginning of the year. Halloween Comic Fest happens at the end of the year. And they give away comics. There's some regular full-size comics. There's some mini-comics. Um, this year, I guess, the big draws are there's Itty Bitty Hellboy. There's a My Little Pony, Adventure Time, uh, Ben 10. Um, there's a full-size reprint of Batman Long Halloween. Um, there's a... Uh, reprint of the uh, Marvel Universe Spider-Man. There's a Cartoon Network uh, triple pack that has Powerpuff Girls, Samurai Jack, Ben 10, um, uh, Sonic. There's actually a new Sonic video game coming out called Lost World, and so they've made a comic that ties in with that. And so uh, that comic is free today, uh, today and tomorrow. If you can't make it to your local comic book shop today, call, see if they're open on Sunday. We are not here at Killing Enterprises, uh, but uh, we also have comics from last year. We, we have stacks. We got way too many comics last year. We got uh, Ghostbusters, Axe Cop, Strawberry Shortcake, Cowboy, Space Hawk. Uh, so we've got extra stuff sitting over there that's free. Plus, whole store is 20% off today. Come into the store 20% off. We're only open until 5, and most of you probably aren't going to listen to this till later, so you've missed the entire sale and everything. But still, uh, for those of you who do make it down today, thanks for coming, and we're glad to have you. Before we get into uh, talking about the Halloween movies today, which is what we're going to do as our focus, uh, we let's talk about a couple things first. The Toy News, Play Arts Kai did put out photos of their uh, upcoming RoboCop figures. They have the original 1987 version of RoboCop that looks beautiful. Like I'm, that's probably one that I'm gonna have to own by uh, by uh, next summer when I hit uh, conventions. I don't know if I'll order it through Diamond. I may wait until just convention season and see if I can hunt it down for the thrill of the hunt. Everybody talks about going to uh, the convention, see if I can find it there. But um, it, it looks gorgeous, uh, eight, the 87 RoboCop. But then they've got two RoboCops coming out for the new movie. Version 1 and version 3, uh, because he does get armored up as the movie goes and uh, streamlined and whatever. Uh, gets upgrades, I guess, for the final battle at the end. So they have both versions of those coming out. Don't know what happened to version 2. 
And it sucks to be version 2. Whoever came up with that design is like, oh man, guys. But nope, uh, your version's not being used for anything, apparently. Uh, but version 1, version 3, they both look nice. And I really have to say, I, I hated the idea of this new RoboCop remake. I hated the uh, costume the first time I saw it because it was not, you know, it didn't look anything like the classic costume. I liked how classic RoboCop was big and clunky and he looked like machines. Um, whereas the new one looks like a dude in the G.I. Joe exosuit. But now that I've seen the trailer, I like it a whole lot more. And I'm finding it, the more I see of the suits, the more I see it in action, the more I see, uh, you know, clear shots of it, the more I, I, I really, I can't hate it like I, I wanted to. I wanted to hate this movie as much as, say, the Halloween remake that we'll be talking about in a little bit. But I really don't. Um, just looking at it, I'm, I'm starting to fall in love with it. I'm going to have to buy some of these toys when they come out. So anyway, uh, you can go to popculturenetwork.com, check out those photos. It's basically just a front and a back shot of each of the figures. But, I mean, that's what Play Arts Kai put out, so that's what we ran with. Uh, so there you go with that. Uh, just some quick wrestling news, since a lot of you guys uh, have been giving me good feedback on the wrestling. We will talk a little bit. Bound for Glory was this last weekend, and then, of course, Impact was last night. And I'm not going to do a full rundown of both the shows. Um, I, I don't really know if people like getting the full rundowns or if they just, you know, want some commentary on it. But the problem, Bound for Glory, I'd say overall was a thumbs up show. Uh, if your choices are thumbs up, thumbs down, I'd say it's thumbs up just because a lot of the wrestling matches were pretty good. Um, the Destination X mac match was pretty safe uh, from the standpoint they didn't do really anything outlandish that was all that dangerous, uh, but it was still uh, it was still a fun match. Uh, they, they did a good job with that. I thought the tag team match with the Bromans um, versus uh, Gunstorm was really good. I loved that tag team match. Uh, I know a lot of people hate the Bromans because it's, uh, you know, Jersey Shore ripoff, whatever, uh, Zack Ryder thing. But uh, I think, uh, I don't know about Robbie E. I mean, he's okay, but Jesse is great. Uh, he's one of those guys that I think he'll be around in uh, 15, 20 years. Um, he'll be one of those guys that if there's not a major promotion of TNA folds, he's not going to get picked up by WWE, but he'd be one of those guys uh, doing the ROH, uh, maybe doing Dragon's Gate appearances, doing, you know, whatever uh, comes along. He's going to be one of those guys out there. I, I think he's got a long career ahead of him. They had, on the pay-per-view, this two-time Mr. Olympia bodybuilder guy in their corner for absolutely no reason. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe he was billed in advance at all. He just uh, showed up on the pre-show and was there during the pay-per-view. Um, and it's one of those things where... If you're really into bodybuilding and the Mr. Olympia stuff, I don't think you're going to buy this pay-per-view just to see this Heath guy standing around ringside. Um, he didn't get involved in the match, so if you're a fan of bodybuilding, why would you tune in just to see this guy standing there? You know, uh, I, I'm assuming they paid him money to be on the show, uh, but I won't take away from the fact that the, the guy did a great job. He was super happy. He sold everything that they were doing. He um, you know, played along with every little bit. And so that was great. Um, I mean, he really, he must be a fan. He's either a fan or he is uh, uh, just a tremendously nice guy. Um, because for being a bodybuilder guy, having nothing to do with wrestling and just randomly appearing on the show, he was really great at what he did. So, I mean, kudos to him. You know, more power to you. Um, but him being there really didn't have anything to do with anything other than the fact that, hey, look, here's a guy going out there with the bromance. But the tag match itself was great. Um, I loved the uh, the energy of it. I loved the intensity. I loved... Uh, and, and Bromance going over getting the title, I'm, I'm totally fine with. Uh, I have no problem with that at all. So, uh, that's fine with that. Uh, I think uh, Kurt Angle, Bobby Roode was a fantastic match. That was a great match. Uh, the only problem was Kurt Angle legitimately knocked himself silly. Uh, which led to some problems, and especially the end. The ending was really weird, where they uh, put him on a backboard, and they were going to stretcher him out, but he got up and walked off on his own power, because he, he legitimately uh, knocked himself silly there at the end, which was uh, rather weird to see, but... <coughs> excuse me. It's live wrestling. What are you going to do? You can't uh, stop that. 
Uh, but Kurt Angle did have a moment earlier in the night with the Hall of Fame that was really bizarre. He, um, he, okay, so they had Jeremy Borash at ring in the ring, and they had Sting come out, and Sting gave this great speech, and then Angle came out, and Sting handed him the Hall of Fame watch, which is a gold watch. And uh, Kurt Angle kind of looked at it, and he said, I just, I, you know, Sting, you set the standard for what someone should be, and I have not lived up to that standard. I've let everybody down. I shouldn't be here. I can't do this, uh, so I'm going to have to decline. And he handed the watch back to him. So he's not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he, uh, he said, you know, at some point in the future, if it feels like he's lived up to his potential or he's uh, doing what he should be doing, then, uh, then he'll join the Hall of Fame. And... You know, it, it all seemed to signify, you know, why was he gone in the first place? It was He was in rehab. He didn't mention that, but you kind of got that that's what he's talking about as far as storyline goes, which is fine, except uh, they didn't follow up with that storyline. Uh, when he was on Impact, there was no, I have to redeem myself. I have to uh, uh, live the good life for the fans. Oh, phone is ringing. Someone is ringing before the store is even open. All right, I'm going to pause this. I'll be right back. All right, we're back. Somebody calling about Halloween Comic Fest, uh, actually. So there's more for that. Um, but, yeah, they didn't follow up the storyline with Kurt Angle. They didn't go into him having to redeem himself. I mean, that wasn't really the focus on Impact. So that didn't go anywhere. And uh, so... You know, it's like they almost had something with that, and then they just kind of blew it. So, I don't know. Maybe they'll follow up more in the coming weeks, but they didn't do it this week. Um, let's see. What else? We had uh, Sting versus Magnus was not great. Um, people didn't really understand that match. They didn't really understand. They When the uh, original promo came out and Sting was yelling at Magnus that he'd be the one to give him his uh, marquee match, people didn't understand really what he was saying. There was no reaction um, they didn't follow it up very well. They tried to put some tension between them uh, by doing some main event mafia tag matches that the uh, communication between the two wasn't that great, but it really didn't uh, really didn't do what it was supposed to. And as far as the match they had, it just wasn't that spectacular. It was fine. There were no major problems with it. Uh, you didn't like feel bad at the end of it. You didn't think that um, you know Sting didn't look terrible or anything like that. It just didn't. It didn't have the energy it needed. Uh, it wasn't that exciting. People really didn't believe that Magnus could beat Sting. Even though that was the whole point. You knew it was going to happen. Just didn't really come across in the match. So uh, that one, I think, was a... You know, again, it was it was fine, but not what it needed to be. Uh, the main event match with AJ Styles uh, and Bully Ray. The match was not AJ's best. Uh, he's definitely had better matches. Um, the, the big issue that I take with that match was before the match, they showed Bully Ray and he's backstage and he's given a pep talk to the aces and eights, except he's standing in a doorway and he's speaking through the doorway, supposedly to the aces and eights, but you can't see who he's talking to. And he makes it sound like he's talking to, uh, Bubba. I'm sorry, not Bubba, Devon. <laughs> and he's talking to, um... Uh, buh, 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 what's his name? Briscoe. And he's talking to, you know, basically uh, Ken Anderson and all the guys who got cut is basically what he makes it sound like they're all there and they're backstage and they've rallied around him and they're going to make this big comeback. And in the middle of the match, he calls for the, the guys to come down to the ring and nobody comes out. Uh, and eventually Dixie Carter herself comes out and they have this, you know, swerve, whatever. Uh, she tries to uh, get involved, but it works against him and AJ Styles ends up winning. And, you know, that's all good and fine, except on Impact, they didn't follow up on it. Again, it was one of those things where they put these seeds of the storyline, and then when they went to follow up on it, there was nothing there. Uh, that's their biggest problem, is that follow-through. They're not thinking this stuff through. They put an angle on TV because they've seen it on TV, but they don't know what to do as the follow-up angle. And uh, that was uh, pretty evident here. The whole storyline with AJ Styles not having a contract, winning the title, that's supposed to be TNA doing the WWE CM Punk storyline. Uh, they were going to do it right. They were going to do what uh, WWE didn't do, and they were going to you know, show how it should be done. And they absolutely did not have that happen. Um, 
AJ Styles won the title. He supposedly has no contract. In reality, he's got a contract through December. Uh, as far as I know, he's not re-signed yet, but he probably will. Uh, there's really no interest from WWE at this point. But uh, the the whole storyline is he has the title. He doesn't have a contract, just like CM Punk, uh, you know, three years ago, whenever that was, four years ago, when CM Punk did the whole pipe bomb, uh, won the title, and left WWE. But the, the problem was... CM Punk left WWE, he was gone for a week. And that was the big failure of the storyline. They should have had a tournament, they should have uh, crowned a new champion, had a new title, CM Punk should return, they have title versus title uh, on this big showdown. And that's not what happened in WWE, uh, and that's what should have happened in TNA, and it didn't. On Impact this week, AJ Styles returns, puts his title on the line, has the follow-up match with Bully Ray, he doesn't have a contract. He's not getting paid for it, uh, but yet he's there anyway to uh, to defend his championship because he's a champion, and that's what champions do, he says. But in the end, it just makes him look like an idiot. He's got the title. He's He can hold them up for money. He can hold them up for fame. He can hold them up for whatever. What they needed was they needed Dixie Carter to say that AJ Styles is never coming back. She's going to have a tournament. Everybody in the company is in the tournament from the smallest guy to the biggest guy to be the new TNA champion. Uh, ODB can even, you know, make an argument that she should fight for it. Uh, you know, Eric Young was a women's tag champion, whatever. So she should be able to fight for the regular title. I mean, they could do all this storyline stuff with it. They could crown a champion. And then in December... Uh, AJ Styles can sign a new contract with somebody, you know, uh, Eric Bischoff is actually in the back and he's gone over Dixie's head and he's re-signed AJ Styles and AJ Styles is back with his title and then they can do a title versus title unification, you know, whatever. There's a storyline. There's something, that's what they should have done. That's what WWE didn't do that TNA should have done and TNA did not do it. Instead, he's back, and uh, that's pretty much it. And the storyline now is that he still doesn't have a title, and he's holding Dixie up for something that's more than money. It was never just about money. Uh, there's more to it than that, and whatever. Uh, it sounds like he's going to try to get an apology from her, or, or whatever. Uh, it, it really just doesn't... It, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It, as far as Impact itself, I mean, the show was fine... Uh, from from a wrestling standpoint, uh, it was okay, um, but I mean, they just they dropped the ball on what could have been the biggest angle forever. Um, the Mister Olympia guy was not there at the show, uh, was not an impact, so they paid him to be on a pay per view, and he made this appearance, never to be seen again. Uh, which is just another example of them pissing away money. You know, didn't make any sense, didn't add anything, but. All right, uh, we're now at uh, just over the 18-minute uh, mark, so we're going to switch gears now and talk about the Halloween movies. Um, oh, wait a minute. First, before I do that, I did get an email uh, from uh, Dusty. Dusty on our boards, Dusty Rushing. Um, this is, okay, first thing. Um he wanted everybody to know that starting with issue 34 of Mega Man, they are starting the Mega Man X arc. Um, so if you're a fan of Mega Man X, then you can check that out in the comic lines. But he said, I wanted to know if you think DC should include a note in its current storylines about when they take place in relation to Trinity War and the Forever Evil story arcs. Um, yeah, well... It is kind of confusing right now. Um, part of the idea with DC is that you just have to read the story and you'll eventually see where everything kind of filters out. Um, Forever Evil is kind of like this company-wide crossover that really kind of isn't. Uh, it's key in some books and it's not in other books. And um, certain characters have disappeared from the DC universe. They're being held in this other world, you know, prison, whatever, and... Um, the evil crime syndicate, who is the Earth-3 version of the Justice League, have taken over the world. And um, without heroes there, you know, the rogues and Flash are, you know, kind of stepping up as being the heroes in a sense of, uh, of that book because, you know, this is their turf and they don't want other guys coming in. And Gotham is all split up between these different factions. Different villains have taken different parts of the city, but Bane wants to come in and take it all for himself. And, you know, there, there's some neat stuff going on, but it's more like a soft crossover. 
it's one of those things where something big is happening, you know, worldwide, uh, and it kind of filters into some stories, but it's not like you have to read all these books to understand, or you even have to read Forever Evil uh, itself to understand what's happening in all these, you know, different books. So, um, I, I mean, it would be nice if they would put that in there, but I kind of get the feeling that that's part of their idea is that this is just the world that everybody lives in, and you just have to kind of... Um, you know, follow along the stories. Everything kind of goes at their own pace and does their own thing. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, all right. Halloween movies. I have always been a big fan of the Halloween movies. Um, several years ago, there used to be a website called 40 Miles to Haddonfield. And uh, I ran a Friday the 13th website, and some guy ran that Halloween one, and we talked on email several times. And uh, totally nice guy. And I really love the Halloween movies and talked a lot of trivia and stuff uh, about the movies. And this was, you know, early days. This was 96, 97. Uh, you know, AOL was still the big thing, you know. Um, so getting a lot of information like today at the drop of the hat, um, you know, it wasn't as easy to find out all of this stuff. But we're going to talk about these movies. And first of all, I have to say... Halloween, the original Halloween movie, one of the best movies of all time. Uh, it's definitely the best of the franchise. Uh, all you Rob Zombie fans, uh, you might as well turn it off now. You're not going to like uh, when we get to the Rob Zombie movies, I can tell you right now. Uh, and they do not hold a candle to the original. The original is one of the greatest films of all time, period. Um, Citizen Kane, you know, War of the Worlds, uh, Casablanca, Gone with the Wind, Halloween. I'm serious. It is phenomenal in every way that they put that movie together. They thought about everything when they made that movie. Uh, basic story, of course. Michael Myers kills his sister as a young boy. He's locked away for several years. He's being transferred as part of, uh, you know, I guess because he's turning 18 or whatever. So they have to transfer him to a different facility. And uh, the night that he's supposed to be transferred is the night before Halloween. He escapes, goes back to his hometown, and starts killing people, trying to get to his long-lost sister, um, who has no idea that she's even related to him or anything like that. Uh, and uh, Dr. Loomis has to lead the charge against him because uh, he knows that Michael Myers is evil and that Michael Myers uh, basically has no humanity left. All right. So there's your, in a nutshell... That's Halloween. The first movie works so well on so many reasons. Um, one, the acting is great. Uh, you know, even the little kids in that movie. Little kids, a lot of times in movies, I have a hard time with. But the the little kids in that movie did a fantastic job. Uh, the acting is solid up and down. I love Donald Pleasance in that movie. Uh, his character is so great. And it's the cinematography in that movie. You don't get... In horror movies, generally speaking, a lot of good shot setup and where scenes play out, uh, you know, using the full widescreen format. Um, one of the things I remember is when I was in high school, Blockbuster Video got the rights to release their own video cassette version of Halloween, and it was a terrible pan and scan version. Uh, you know, movies, of course widescreen, rectangular format, you know, TVs nowadays all come in the, the widescreen format, uh, high-definition TVs in the widescreen format. And, uh, you know, back in the day, of course, you had square TVs. They had to take a rectangle and chop off the edges in order to make it fit on your square TV, or they put the black bars at the top and the bottom. Now, I always preferred to get the black bars at the top and the bottom, even though I had a tiny TV. Like, in my room at home, I had, like, a 13-inch TV. It's the TV I had for several years. But I would still always go for that widescreen format because I knew that that's how you were supposed to see the movie. But Blockbuster released this pan-and-scan version where they cut off the, the edges of it. And the problem with a movie like Halloween is that a lot of the music cues are from stuff happening in the sides and the background of the shot. And in their pan and scan version, they cut off some of the stuff happening on the sides. So that, uh, you know, when they're in the Myers home at the end, for instance, and Lori stabs him with the uh, coat hanger and he falls over seemingly dead and she gets out and she collapses in the hallway and she's crying and you just see Michael sit up in the background and the music does that, -da -da -da, you know, so you know that boo, there's something happening. In that pan and scan version, he's cut out of the frame. You don't see him. 
She's just sitting there crying, and all of a sudden you hear, but you don't see anything. There's, like, why is this music happening? There's nothing. So, uh, as far as it goes, you have to watch it widescreen. Um, if you have a square TV still these days, and you've never seen the movie, make sure you get a widescreen format version of it. Uh, if you're watching on DVD, make sure you have it set for the, uh, uh, for the widescreen. It definitely makes a difference. Uh, and it's it's just key. And of course now, you know, you can read all of the trivia. It was the uh, most successful independent movie of all time. I think up until uh, something just a couple of years ago, Paranormal Activity or something may have uh, finally knocked it off the throne. I, I don't remember. Blair Witch maybe. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, it, it held the title for a long time. It was, uh, you know, super big deal. And the one of the things that, that I found interesting was I was at a comic book convention in 90... 93, 94, somewhere in there. And somebody had the extended version of the movie. And, uh, you know, whoa, extended version. And this is back in the day before you had director's cuts, before you could buy, uh, you know, the DVD, the Blu-ray that, you know, had an extended version on it. It was generally what you saw in the theater was what, what the cut was. To get an unrated cut, a director's cut was, you know, never, never heard of. And I saw this extended cut. So, of course, I grabbed it. And it had different footage in it that I hadn't seen before. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. So I did a little research and, um, you know, again, back in those days, the internet wasn't handy. Uh, some of you may know this, some of you may not, but when the movie was optioned for television, NBC wanted to air it on TV and it needed to fit into a two hour time slot. So they, you know, cut the movie to fit, uh, you know, the commercial breaks and everything. They cut out all the blood and they cut out the nudity and they cut out the swearing and, you know, all that stuff to make it safe for TV. The movie was too short. It didn't fit into that two-hour time limit. Well, luckily, they were filming the sequel at the time. So they went back and they filmed new scenes uh, to basically fill up the rest of the time. So you had Loomis visiting Michael in the hospital as a boy, uh, after he learned that Michael was evil, um, you had Loomis talking to the uh, you know medical board, trying to say that Michael shouldn't be transferred and it's a mistake and you know whatever. Uh, they had extra scenes of Lori at home, uh, getting ready to uh, you know babysit after school, uh, you know before going out, uh, you know taking a shower and a friend comes over to borrow some clothes and whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, just this extra stuff kind of thrown in there. And I, I was really, uh, as as a young person, finding out that they do extra stuff for movies like that, I was like, wow, that's that's really cool. And so, of course, uh, it, it helped that that was the dawn of uh, DVD a few years later. I think 98 was really when DVDs uh, started to hit the mainstream. And you could start getting the the outtakes and getting the director's cuts and the unrated versions and everything like that. So that was really cool. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I don't know if any of those scenes are on any current Blu-rays or DVDs or if you have to go out, because these are on the Laserdisc, if I remember correctly, and someone had recorded them off the Laserdisc and edited them into the movie at the right place where they needed to be. It was like a fan sub uh, type situation had put out there. So, it, you know, if you look around on the internet, I'm sure you look hard enough, you'll be able to find it. I've got an old VHS cassette uh, in my basement, but uh, it is kind of neat to see some of those other scenes and how they uh, fit in there. But first movie is by far the best. Uh, it doesn't get any better than the first Halloween, uh, but it definitely gets a lot worse. Uh, I can say that with certainty. All right, Halloween 2. Halloween 2 was basically just a quick follow-up. Uh, they uh, you know, wanted to make a sequel because it made a lot of money. And, of course, back in those days, the idea of selling a, you know, the home video of it wasn't part of the marketing or part of the uh, strategy of making money. Basically, movies were in the theater, and then when they were done, they were out of the theater, and that was pretty much the end of movies. Um, they could, you know, if a movie was really popular, they'd bring it back or they'd extend the engagement or whatever. Uh, but, you know, I mean, to, to make money you want to start a franchise and you want to make another movie really and so uh they made the sequel they made halloween 2 and it basically continued right off from the uh, moment where the first one ended uh lori strode goes to the hospital michael follows her there carnage ensues and in the end uh dr loomis shoots michael apparently in both of his eyes 
uh, making him bleed blood out of his eyes. Apparently, you can get shot in the eye, but it doesn't per penetrate the brain. It won't kill you. Uh, but he gets shot in the eyes and then sets him on fire. And uh, that's supposedly the end of Michael Myers. Um, the movie is not as well done as the first one. It plays for a lot of the horror movie tropes that the first one kind of avoided. Uh, there's a lot more nudity. Um, there's characters that are totally uh, kind of stock, cardboard cutout, horror movie characters. Um, it's not as well directed the cinematography is not as great um the acting isn't as solid just in every way that it's kind of a, a down uh step from the first one this one is saying that though it's it, it's still very uh entertaining it's still very fun uh it's still very enjoyable not as good as the first the first one is an a plus then this is maybe a b plus maybe a b um, not terrible, you know, but it's not the greatest. Uh, it does its job and it does okay. There are two versions of this. Again, they, they thought about the fact that they'd have to make a TV version, uh, because they had to go back and shoot the scenes through the TV version of the first one. And so they kept that in mind while they were filming. And there are two versions of this movie that exist. There's the regular version and the TV version. And the TV version actually doesn't make sense in a lot of spots. Um, there's a scene where one of the nurses gets a, uh, IV stuck in her arm and drips the blood slowly out of her, making this like big puddle of blood on the ground. And, um, guy from the last starfighter is actually in this, um, what is his name? Lance Guest. Lance Guest was, uh, from the last starfighter is in this along with Jamie Lee Curtis. And he's Ben Tramer, actually the, uh, the boy that she always had the crush on. She talks about in the first movie. Um, uh, in, in the movie, he finds the body of this nurse and he sees her laying there bleeding and he freaks out and he turns to run away and he slips on the blood and he falls down and hits his head on the ground and blood splashes up from the ground onto his face as he's laying there in that pool of blood. In the TV version, for whatever reason, they didn't want to show, uh, this lady laying there bleeding out. So they show, they do like this weird edit where he's like, I don't even remember correctly how they do it in the TV version, but he's like running down these steps and he's in the basement and you just see him like turning and running and then suddenly, whoops, he just slips and falls and he's got blood on his face. So it looks like he fell down and hit his head so hard that he's bleeding out of the mouth, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, he's just like this guy running and trips and falls and hits his head. Um, but I mean, that's what they did. That's what they did to make it, you know, work for TV. You can get Halloween two on DVD and Blu-ray now with both versions of the movie. Um, and I know that because we've sold it here at the store. So, uh, if you do want to see the difference, if you're one of those people that likes to see how they do things differently, you can get that, uh, Blu-ray, DVD, and see both versions. And it's uh, a commemorative version. It's a, I don't know, 25-year anniversary of it or something like that. And, um, you know, it makes the point that it is, uh, you know, the special version with both uh, both versions of the movie. So you can go and find that. And like I said, it's okay. Not great, uh, but not terrible either. Halloween 3 is a big departure from the franchise. Halloween 3 has nothing to do with Michael Myers or Haddonfield. Um, they, they got the idea that they wanted Halloween to be a franchise about movies set on Halloween, which I mean, sure. Uh, except that they didn't want it to be continually about Michael Myers. They were hoping that they would be able to take the story of Halloween and just do a whole bunch of movies about spooky stuff that happens on Halloween night. And there you go. Um, it's Tom Atkins is the star on this. And, you know, he's a guy you saw in a lot of cop movies in the 70s and 80s and uh, um, done a lot of genre work. Uh, he does a good job. Uh, also, the um, the old man from RoboCop, Dan O'Hurlihy, Her I forget how you say his name. But anyway, he's in this. He plays the big bad guy, Silver Shamrock. He basically... 
okay, so here's the storyline, right? He's got a stone from Stonehenge, and he's carving little pieces of it off, and he's putting it into these medallions that he sews onto Halloween masks, so that people will put on the Halloween masks, and then on Halloween night, he runs this commercial on TV that has this secret embedded code in the video signal that sets off these chips inside the medallions attached to the masks that kills uh, the, the entire family using this ancient... Uh, Norse black magic or druid black magic or whatever it's supposed to be um, as order for these like sacrifices for the night of Samhain which it's hokey it's stupid it's a great jingle uh, it's it's happy happy Halloween silver shamrock you'll get it stuck in your head forever um, it, it's great as far as being its own thing it, the budget is not as high as it should have been for the type of movie it was, so it does come off looking cheap. Um, you definitely have to be in the right frame of mood when you see it. Uh, it's a B minus, uh, C plus maybe even. Uh, it's it's not great. It's not the worst thing you've ever seen, um, but you do have to you know divorce it from the rest of the Halloween franchise because it really doesn't fit in with anything else having to do with it. Um, the franchise was pretty much dormant for several years until Halloween 4 came along. Um, Halloween 4 and Halloween 5 were filmed very closely together and released, I believe, a year apart. And they basically told the story of Laurie Strode had died, but she had a daughter before she died. Michael Myers learns of this, uh, and he escapes, and he's trying to hunt down this girl. And uh, in 4, it's basically a remake of the first movie. I mean, that's really what it is. It goes back to the first movie and redoes it in a more modern setting. Uh, and it's really good. I, I love this. Like, it's not as good as the first one, uh, but it's definitely very good. Uh, as far as, like, if you look at Halloween 2 and Halloween 4, I'd say that they're probably pretty equal. I'd give 4 the edge over 2. Uh, but it does show the difference between movie making with the 70s mindset you know, late 70s exploitation type stuff with the first, with Halloween 2, uh, whereas Halloween 4 is in that modern era of slasher, the Jason, Freddy, uh, all of that type of stuff. Um, you can definitely see a difference just by this franchise, looking at those two movies on how, uh, you know, everything changes. Uh, but it's it's really fun. It's really good. Um, Ellie Cornell, I guess is her name, uh, the actress that plays uh, the uh, you know, foster sister um, of the little girl. And, of course, the little girl is Danielle Harris. Uh, she does these two movies, and then she comes back for the remake, uh, the Rob Zombie Halloween. Um, again, it, it's nothing spectacular and great. Um, it, it is definitely aping the first movie. It's a good sequel, really, for the first movie. Um, it's a lot of fun. The, the budget is actually pretty good. Uh, for what it is. Um, it, it's not a masterpiece like the first one is, uh, obviously. But it's still really good, really enjoyable. And it's one of those movies that I can pretty much watch that one every year. Halloween time rolls around. I'll watch the first one. I'll watch the fourth one. Maybe the second. Probably not the fifth. Um, but, you know, whatever. Uh, number six comes along... Or, I'm sorry, number five comes along... Number five, like I said, filmed um, right on the heels of four. And five is like watching TNA Impact. Uh, they set up some storylines that they don't follow through with. Um, they put some swerves in there that don't make any sense. Um, and it's just not handled as well. Uh, there's a couple big, big problems with it. Uh, but the key in this storyline is that Daniel Harris's uh, character has filmed this psychic link with Michael Myers. And so she can sometimes have visions of what he sees, and she reenacts what he's uh, acting. And uh, as Halloween approaches, you know, they want to get on with their lives, they want to uh, just have a nice, fine Halloween, whatever. Uh, and um, uh, Michael is returning, and mayhem is coming, and she's having these flashes, and everybody thinks she's going crazy, but Dr. Loomis, of course, believes in her. Uh, and tries to get her to uh, draw Michael Myers out so he can kill Michael Myers once and for all. Uh, and so, the, you know, the franchise is this Loomis versus Michael Myers thing. This is what it becomes. Um, big problems in this movie. For one thing, 
some whoever the director was decided he didn't like the Myers house. The Myers house looked too plain. He wanted something gothic and spooky. So he picked an entirely different house to suddenly be the Myers house. The Myers house suddenly looks like this weird gothic house. So of course, you had to take the uh, the, the family that has taken in uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's daughter and put them in a new house because he wants the new house to look like the Myers house. So Myers house is this big spooky gothic house. So then they have to suddenly be in a different house that looks kind of like the Myers house. So that there's this uh, mental connection you make between the two houses. Then, at the end of the movie, for no reason whatsoever, this guy in, uh, uh, this man in black, in cowboy boots and spurs, I think, it made this clicking sound when he's walking, almost like spurs, uh, suddenly they, they capture uh, Michael Myers, they have him in the, ho- in the uh, jail cell, and this guy just busts in with a machine gun, blows away all the cops... Uh, dynamites the wall of the jail cell, and he and Michael Myers escape into the night. So suddenly you have this man in black who's part of the storyline, and really, for no reason. There's no build-up to it, there's no explanation of it. It's basically this guy wants to add a swerve at the end, uh, like a TNA wrestling show. He just wants some sort of swerve, so he just throws this guy in there and has this ending, which which was not in the original scripts. Uh, He just wanted it to happen. Uh, and so he just threw it in there. So from a movie standpoint, this is a failure. Um, this is... I'm going to give it a D. Uh, I'm not going to give it an F. Uh, I'm going to save the F for later. Uh, but this one is a D. Uh, it is not good. Uh, the only real reason to watch it is just because you're you know, following the storyline and you want to see four. And they tried to redeem it in part six. Uh, Halloween 6, which was originally... Um, Halloween 666, the the origin of Michael Myers, becomes Halloween 6, the curse of Michael Myers. This is the movie, um, because of the way it was funded, and I forget exactly, something happened with the rights to it. They needed money, and so they uh, brokered a deal with a different company. But because of uh, what happened with the rights on this movie, you can now find this movie all over the place in those budget movie packs. Uh, you go to Kmart or Walmart or someplace like that, and they have... You know, six horror movies for five bucks, uh, something like that. Uh, And it'll be in those packs. This movie is, again, one of those where there's a director's cut and there's a theatrical cut. What they tried to do in this movie is explain the man in black. They said, you know, this is stupid, it doesn't make sense, but we're going to try to do as best we can. So they try to come up with a storyline of the druids and uh, this cult of uh, Thorn... And um, someone in the family has to kill in order uh, kill their family in order to uh, remove this curse from the from the village and everybody else is saved. And the original uh, cut of the movie you can find on the internet. There's a guy uh, Ouroboros from uh, DCP, which was a comics preservation thing. Uh, They were scanning comics and putting it online. He apparently encoded a a version of the director's cut and put it online, uh, which is cool. And um, it it is completely different ending. Um, In the theatrical version, the ending is based around they go to the hospital uh, at Smith's Grove and they find like this eugenics lab and they find all these baby fetuses in jars and Michael Myers has been this genetic experiment from these modern day druids uh, to try to build this killer who would kill his family to save everybody from the curse. In the original movie, it's all druids. Um, there's They're, they're going to sacrifice this baby at the end and they have this big... Uh, um, I don't even know what you'd call it, like a a black mass or whatever going on. And uh, they're going to sacrifice this baby to save everybody. And uh, they use runes in order to uh, use black magic against each other. And Paul Rudd uh, from Anchorman, uh, he's in this. Uh, He's the lead guy in this. And um, he basically knows the story of the runes. And uh, uh, he uses them to stop Michael Myers and to make his escape. And... um, Dr. Loomis goes back in and the druids use the black magic on Dr. Loomis to make Dr. Loomis the new man in black. He's the one that has to make Michael continue to kill. Um, And uh, Dr. Wynn, who you saw in the very first movie, who reappears in this movie, he had been the man in black. He dies um, making Loomis the new man in black. So, I mean, it it was a little uh, uh, hokey. 
uh, you know, when you're doing druids and black magic or whatever, but I think that original director's cut was was much better, uh, kept the tone, made a lot more sense. Um, so overall, that's a much better film than what orig- what finally came out in theaters and what you're going to find on DVD everywhere. So I enjoyed it. The Even the theatrical version is fine, um, but it's not great. Um, but, I mean, you're still looking at the difference between maybe a, a C- minus and a C+, plus, or maybe a C- minus and a B- minus between the two movies. I mean, it's uh, uh, they're not that far apart, even with those changes, but it is, it is enough uh, to note that it makes a difference. So then... Uh, a couple years later, we get Halloween H2O, 20th anniversary of the first movie. They bring back Jamie Lee Curtis. She didn't die. Uh, she went into hiding. Why she abandoned her daughter, we don't know. Uh, but it seems like she's an alcoholic, so maybe she didn't have a choice. They took her daughter away from her, uh, gave her to her family. And that's what happened in 4 and 5. Uh, so in this movie, um, basically Michael Myers somehow finds out Uh, that she is alive and she's changed her name and she's living out in Southern California. So he makes a trek cross country and finds her uh, at this border, uh, border school. Yeah, well, uh, technically boarding school. There you go. That's a term, not border school. It's not for Mexican and Americans to uh, come together and learn. This is a a, uh, boarding school where the people send off their kids and the kids live there during the school year. Halloween's coming. Most people leave to go home for Halloween, except a handful of kids who stay. And um, this was a movie that had a lot of the up-and-coming kids. There's like Michelle Williams from uh, Dawson's Creek is on it. And uh, uh, Josh Hartnett is in it. And I I don't know, whatever. Uh, Bigger budget. The thing really about this story, uh, about this movie, that's the, the, the thing that you really look for when you watch this movie is that when they first did the film, they totally changed the Michael Myers mask. Uh, He wore a mask that had these giant bug eyes. Uh, They cut out the eye holes to be really big. Um, The mask had no... uh, The hair was slicked back. Uh, It had less emotion. It was more of just like this white blob with these black eyes. And uh, when they released the trailer, everybody complained. Everybody hated it. Um, If you went... uh, Online at the time, this is 98, this is the early days of, uh, you know, the internet really starting to take hold, and this is where the first real campaign from horror fans happened. Everybody hated the way this mask looked, um, and they they just kept sending emails and hounding the company and, and making phone calls and whatever, and if you go and read the production notes and talk to some of the people involved in the interviews that they've done, they talk about how they weren't really happy with the mask and they wanted to make some changes and it was a work in progress, but uh, I think it's just that everybody hated it so much and the feedback was so terrible, they started working on changing it. The problem was they'd already filmed certain parts of it, so they went back and they actually CGI'd a new Michael Myers mask on top of the other Michael Myers mask in several key scenes. If you go back and watch the original trailer, you can see that that bug-eyed mask and the parts where it's supposed to be in the movie. Sometimes from a distance, you can kind of see it, but when they do the close-ups, it's actually a CGI mask. The lighting is wrong. The texture looks off. But, I mean, this is early days of trying to do, you know, CGI edits on top of something already filmed not meant for CGI. Uh, So, I mean, kudos to them for trying, but you can see the mask does change a couple times throughout the movie because at some points it's CGI, at some points it was the version 2 of the mask, at some points it was the version 3, the one that they finally went with uh, and did a lot of the filming with. Um, So that's kind of interesting to look for. The movie overall, it's not that great. LL Cool J is this guard in there and he's doing jokes and whatever. Um, it, It... I mean, it has its moments, but it really, it's not as good as the others. And it's really, it, it's really kind of boring in comparison to the other ones. They tried to do it as kind of like a scream uh, type thing and, it, you know, having the young uh, kids on there, but it just didn't, it didn't have the right feel. It didn't work out. It's Southern California. It's not middle of America. So it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. Uh, and it just, you know, it had problems. Next, we got Halloween Resurrection. Uh, this came out in 2002. You had several years in between. Uh, in this one, they finally kill off Laurie Strode. Jamie Lee Curtis finally dies in this one, and she dies at the beginning. Uh, they made a big deal about her being back, and then she's dead. Uh, but what they tried to do is mix in the modern era. So they have these kids on a reality TV show where they're going into the old Myers house, and they have little cameras attached to their goggles. 
Um, and you can follow this live stream on the internet and watch as all this stuff is going on. And one of the guys watching, um, you know, kind of has a crush on this girl who's on the show, and he sees that Michael Myers is in there and that it's real and it's legit. And he uh, freaks out and he's trying to help them stay alive while watching this live stream on the internet. And it, it, it was one of those movies that had like these flashes of brilliance. Like there are these, these moments where the idea that you can see the same way that we as viewers watch a movie and watch the murder and mayhem unfold before us, they watching a reality TV show watching the murder and mayhem unfold before them, but they can actually try to save them and try to interact. It had these flashes of really great stuff, but then it pisses it all away. <laughs> it Then it becomes this really stupid... They find, like, this room where Michael was apparently chained as a little boy, and um, the Busta Rhymes and um, Tyra Banks are in this movie. Um... And they, they're like these joke characters, and they let Buster Rhymes like do these kung fu moves on Michael Myers in the garage while it's burning, and he's you know doing his little one liners, and uh, it, it all falls apart. It, it, it really, I think, with uh, you know a rewrite, uh, if they had really kind of focused on that idea of. of frantically trying to save somebody you're watching this happen to. It makes a great statement on reality TV. It makes a great statement on us as viewers watching, uh, you know, the carnage unfold. There's some great stuff that it tries, but it just ultimately fails. So then finally, we have the last two Halloween movies, which are the Rob Zombie Halloween remake and Halloween 2. And uh, what I'm going to say on these is that I... I'm not a fan. And I will say that now. I will say that straight up front. I've seen both versions of Halloween 1. I saw the pre-release version uh, that escaped onto the internet before it actually came out. And then I saw the theatrical version. Um, I had a friend who worked in the movie theater and they got the movie a couple days early. So I went and saw it. You know, it was, it was, I think I was the only one in the theater. Uh, very well might have been. I don't remember. It was not good. I do not like Rob Zombie's take on Michael Myers. There's so many things wrong with it from... You know, the whole point of the original movie is that Michael is an unassuming uh, villain. He's the normal kid who snaps for no reason. There's pure evil in him that you can't explain. He is the boogeyman. You don't know why. Um, there's no explanation for it. Uh, it follows along the same ideas that you've seen in movies like The Stepfather. Um, you know, this idea that you have this normal person who just one day snaps, becomes a killer, except it, this time it happens to be a kid, and that's what kind of made it so creepy in the first one. Rob Zombie instead made the mother a stripper, the dad's an alcoholic, the kid is bullied and maybe even sexually abused, you're not sure. He starts slashing out, killing animals, and um, his sister's a whore, and um, just... Uh, he gives him a terrible, terrible life so that it makes sense for Michael Myers to become a killer. And then he becomes every other serial killer in the world. You, if you watch any of the crime shows on um, Investigation Discovery Channel, uh, you're going to see the exact same story of this movie a thousand times over. Uh, people from bad backgrounds, their parents didn't love them, uh, it was terrible, uh, yada, yada, yada. And now suddenly... Um, uh, they become a killer and they kill everybody. And the, just the first movie, it missed that basic point to such a degree that I found myself just unwilling to even watch the sequel. I've never seen ha Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I have seen the original Halloween probably 30, 40 times. Halloween 2 uh, a good uh, maybe 15 times. Um, I've seen Halloween 4... Uh, probably 30 times. Um, you know, Halloween 6, I've probably seen a dozen times. Halloween, Rob Zombie's Halloween, I saw it twice because I saw both edits of it. Never seen Halloween 2. Uh, he just does everything wrong. Uh, the tone is wrong. The look is wrong. You know, Michael Myers is supposed to come from this innocent white bread family. So there's no reason for him to be a killer. But instead, he makes it the white trash family. So, of course, uh... He uh, becomes just like the biggest, you know, 
douche becomes a killer. Uh, Clone Yoshi put a question here on the forums at jointheforums.com, and he asked, uh, how long do you think it'll be till Halloween poops out another movie? Ah, uh, boy. I'm hoping enough time will pass they will do some sort of Michael versus Freddy, Michael versus Jason type movie, just like they did Freddy versus Jason. They'll do some sort of uh, Ash versus Michael Myers, something along those lines. Um, and then... Once that's done, they can reboot the franchise from scratch uh, or even do something where Michael Myers is, you know, in his 50s and he comes back to kill and passes the curse on to somebody else. And uh, they can make something work out of it because as it stands, um, I, I do not like the Rob Zombie movies. I will not watch two just because I was so disappointed in one. And, um, and I, I really... I mean, Devil's Rejects was pretty good from Rob Zombie. House of a Thousand Corpses was not great. Uh, his Halloween was missed the point. Um, I, I just I'm not a fan of Rob Zombie's movies. Uh, he got lucky as far as I'm concerned with one movie, and then the rest of it is just not panned out. So anyway. All right, I'm out of time. We're going to have to open the store here for Halloween Comic Fest. Let everybody in. If you're in the area, feel free to stop by. Today, we're open till 5. Uh, but otherwise, guys, like I said, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to dirt at popculturenetwork.com. You can send me a tweet. It's at PCN underscore dirt. You can leave us a message on our 24-hour voicemail line. It's 217-953-4025. Or go to jointheforums.com, the official forums of the Pop Culture Network. That's going to do it for me, guys. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you guys after a while.